Hey everybody! Today's episode is brought to you by Keep the Heroes Out, which are developing a new digital version of their cooperative dungeon defense deck building game that I was a huge fan of when I covered it on the channel a few years ago. So I figured, let's show you how it works in video game form. You can play remotely, online, or sitting on the couch with your friends. And let's jump in. So I gotta pick which adorable denizen of the dungeon will defend their home. They all have different strengths and weaknesses. Kind of partial to the witches because their thing is they can create portals really quick and easy. Plus, they've got two hit points where most um, characters only have one. So let's go with the witches. And that's it. I could roll if I'm playing solo, but you can play up to four players, you know, a pass and play or online. Let's bring somebody else in. Uh, let's add another player. You want to have the dragon, the big, super tough dragon who has five hit points? Sure. Let's, uh, let's roll the witches and the dragon. And and now I gotta pick which level I want. Each one of them has uh, unique special rules that change up the core deck building gameplay. Um, four is fun. All hail the Bullfrog King. Let's jump into that one. So you can get at a glance a list of what all the special rules are. Uh, basically, the frogs, which we use as a reagent to make potions, we basically boil the frogs to make potions in the regular game. But now they've got a revolutionary leader, and there's a frog army growing that can actually attack us back. Normally, frogs are a good thing we use, but now they can be causing us trouble. So those are the special rules this time. Le should I jump into hardcore? You want hardcore? Let's go hardcore. Alrighty, and there's a little story about how the uh, the frog revolution came about. Apparently, the uh, local witch ended up turning a prince into a frog, and the uh, the prince frog says, "No more. We will not be your potion fodder." And uh, so we are ready to go and deal with the ribbit revolution. Okay, so. Here is our dungeon. Um, right now, it's player one. That's me. I am the witches. And I have to deploy them. The witches can go in two different rooms. In the room with the cauldron, where the uh, potions are made. Or down here, in the room of the, the library, where we get the books we need to learn new spells. Um, you know what? Right now, I'm going to put them both in here, because this is nice and central. Plus, it means the witches are very close to all the problem spots. See these flashing gems? These are where the bad guys are. And so, if I want to know a little bit more, I can always push this button, and it shows, hey, here's my two witches, and here's all the frogs. Normally, I would just pick these frogs up and stew them into a potion, but now these frogs can fight back. In fact, these frogs might start overrunning our dragon, who always starts in the horde room. That's my teammate, and my teammate is in danger with those frogs. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Well, this is a deck builder. Here's the hand of cards I started with. And hey, right off the bat, I could play this card to do two ranged attacks or to draw a card and uh, be ready to defend myself. That's nice. Let's actually save our buddy, uh, the dragon. Let's uh, attack an adjacent room. So, since both of my witches are here, uh, it doesn't matter which one, let's say we're going to attack, and uh, let's attack up here. You can see the little frogs. Okay, there's one less now. Let's attack again, and take out the other frog. And uh, my dragon buddy breathes a sigh of relief. There's still three more frogs, which normally this would not be the case. Normally, you got to go out of your way to make the frogs. We're not normally drowning in frogs like this. There is a frog in this room with us. Let's do with, deal with that. Um, let's go on ahead and throw it in the cauldron and use it to make one of these three potions. At any given time, there are five cards on display that, well, you know, the, let's see, here's a uh, little... What is that? Is that a minotaur? Um, that we can tame. There is a scroll we could learn, and there are three potions. How do we make a potion? Throw the frog in the pot. Let's do that. I'm going to play this card that says, hey, two things. Move and interact. I can do it in any order I want, or I could undo if I, pre if I chose the wrong card. Let's interact with this room. I could put a teleporter in this room. And then when I put a teleporter in another room, we can start getting around the dungeon much quicker. Maybe I should have had one down here so I could have put teleporters between these two rooms so that we don't have to spend so much time walking back and forth. Okay, maybe later. Right now, I'm doing the other thing I can do with this room. Throwing the um, frog in the pot. 
So now I can get one of these three potions. This is a deck builder. It's going to go into my deck. This one says, hey, dig through your deck to find movement cards. Dig through your deck to find trap cards. I don't think the witches have any trap cards, so that one's no good. Dig through your deck to get defense cards. You know what? Being able to move is a good thing. Let's go on ahead and throw in the, hey, if I, if I need to move and I didn't draw any cards, this will let me go looking for them. Let's throw that into the deck. Now, I'm half done, and you can see, hey, here's now a weapon that we could get if our, our uh, what do you call it, our dragon on their turn might go and build some of these weapons that are shown. But anyway, I've still got, I'm not done with my card. Now I can move. Let's move. Let's have one of these wizards, or witches, uh, come up here to join the dragon because it's safe now. Bop, bop, bop. Okay. And I've still got more cards. I can come... Ooh. Let's see. What I was thinking about doing was... Um, right. We, okay, we've got these other frogs, right? Yeah, we've got a frog to the left and the right of the room where the dragon and one of my two witches is. Okay. You know what? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell my other witch to, first of all, move and come up here. And then I'm going to say, hey, interact with this room. They could, again, make a portal, or they could make a coin. We're going to make a gold coin. Now, that coin could be taken over here and used in the forge to forge that weapon. All right, I've still got a couple of cards left. Let's go on ahead and do another super double-ranged attack. All righty, and let's attack over here and take out the frog there. And over here, and take out the frog there. We have dealt with the froggy threat. And I've still got one card. I could actually summon a frog now. I could interact with this room, or I could... S well, I could summon another witch, but the witches, there can only be two of them, so I can't summon another witch. I don't have to play this card. If I don't, it'll, I'll carry it over to the next round. But let's just go on ahead and interact, and finally make our first portal. Boop. There. So now, if I make a portal somewhere over there, it's you know it's just one step to jump back and forth. Okay, and we're gonna say that's it. There's a couple other things I can do, but I'm gonna end it right there. And now here come the heroes. A rogue is attacking over there. No one's there. A rogue attacks over there. Nobody's there. We're safe so far. Okay. So they moved in, but no, no, we don't lose any of our heroes who are all safe in this room. Let's continue on. And now here comes an archer, and the archer... Ooh, I, it's a good thing I got out of there. My witches would have gotten grabbed, and an archer showed up over there. They were looking for him, but we got out of the way. Phew, that was close. All righty. But this archer came into this room and looted one of our treasure chests. Loot now, questions later. Which means each player has to lose one card from their hand. So this is what my next hand looks like. I got to get rid of one of them. I'll get rid of one of these because I don't need to be summoning frogs right now. They're a danger to us. Though the dragon player has to get rid of one as well. Let's see. A double move. Move and attack or interact. Move and attack or interact. You've got two of those. Let's just get rid of one of those. Okay. And they keep taunting us. And oh, here is the other thing. Um, we've got this archer is going to shoot into the room and is shooting at us. But I have a defense card in my deck, so I'm going to play it and defend. Yay! Alrighty, so that, it's always the player takes a turn, then the bad guys take a turn. This is the bad guys deck. You can see one of the rogue cards has been played, one of the archer cards have been played. There's three more rogues, three more archers, four wizards, four um, warriors, and the two frog Valhalla cards that will be a frog again if we don't keep the frogs under control. Okay, so anyway, the dragon is up. What does the dragon want to do? The dragon can move very far. The dragon could move and then attack. Could just come in and take out these rogues and then interact with stuff. Let's see. Where are the where are they already? Okay, there's a rogue there. There's a rogue there. There's an archer there. I don't like this archer taking pot shots at us. Do not care for that, says the dragon. So the dragon says, I'm going to play um, this card. Alrighty, and I, it shows it for... All right, we're going to move. And we're going to come from this room down to this room. And oh, do we want to bring the coin? No, we don't need the coin here. We need the coin over there. So we'll just leave the coin behind. And now we are going to attack and take out that archer. Done. All righty. Now, let's see. He's got a couple of ranged attacks. He could interact here. We, there's no frogs to interact in this room. Um, what else can he do? Uh, now he can make a double move and double time it over to that rogue and then take that rogue out too. That's not bad. Hmm. Yeah, let's do that. Let's go on ahead and play this double move. 
Alrighty, we're going to do our first move from this room to this room, and then our second move from that room to that room. Oh, and do we want to take the coin? No, nope, we'll leave the coin behind, thanks. Because ultimately the coin's got to go to that room. And now, let's do um, another attack and move. First of all, we will attack, take out that rogue, and then we will move back over here. Because he loves... Or no, we could, we could spread out. We could come over here and start getting books to make spells. We come over here, start getting bones um, to make... Uh, to Oh, to recruit the pets? Yeah, I want to do that. Let's just keep on coming over there. All right, so the dragon is over there now. Um, and they're going to interact with this room and create a bone. Now, in a future turn, they'll pick the bone up, they'll bring it back here, which will let them build their deck. And so he's played all his cards. The dragon doesn't have to be done, though, because you've always got this card you can play once per turn. This lets an enemy into the dungeon, but they immediately get captured. So let's do that. All right? Oh, and it, okay, it was the frog, it was one of the frog again cards. So we completely avoided frog again. But whenever you do that power, you get to draw three more cards. The dragon isn't done now. The dragon can um, go on ahead and move back this way. Move back this way. You come here, come in this direction, bring the bone. All right, and now there's nobody to fight, so we're just going to skip the rest of the card. And then can play this card to interact with this room and deck build, and um, put this cool little Minotaur buddy in the deck that basically lets you draw a card, move, and attack. Very nice. Okay, and so, could move some more, but we could just keep this so we're free to move around other times. Let's just go on ahead and be done. All right, and then here come the heroes. Oh my gosh, it's another frog again. Too bad I wiped out all the frogs, frog prince. Alrighty. Oh, but he did summon some more frogs up there in the sewer. So that's something we'll have to deal with. Meanwhile, wizards are attacking. The dragon took one point of damage from that wizard. This wizard just moved into the room with a rogue. And now they are going to plunder the chest, which makes us lose cards. Oh, dear. Oh, wait. Oh, no, no. It was something else. All right. Okay. So anyway, though, we're back to the witches and we've got a bunch of new cards. I need to take these coins, move over here so I can make the super shovel, build some weapons. We've got more bad guys. And um, you can see more bad guys are coming, but the frog again cards are done. So as they play more of their cards, you can make a more informed guess about what rooms they're going to appear in so you can stay safe and avoid taking damage or losing troops, etc., etc. Anyway, folks, we are just getting started. But hopefully, that gives you a little bit of an idea of the digital implementation of Keep the Heroes Out. And if you'd like to know more, there's a link down in the show notes that will take you to the crowdfunding page. Okay, I'm just going to, in closing, say thanks to Keep the Heroes Out for sponsoring the show. And you know what time it is, folks. We're at the end of the month, or the beginning of the month, depending on when you see this. And I'm going to tell you about all the games Jen I played over the last month, November 2024. Give you a belated uh, happy Thanksgiving if such a thing is of interest to you. And uh, folks, what have I got? 13, 13 games that Jen and I played in this RV on this dinette table um, as we are traveling further and further south through Baja, Mexico. Right now, uh, I'm sorry, this is not the most exciting. If only the camera rotated just a little bit that way, you'd be seeing beautiful La Gringa Beach. Uh, in Baja de Los Angeles, where Jen and I have been for about a week. We'll be here for a few more days before we move on. But actually, if you could see all of that, it's so bright and sunny, it would just blow out the window anyway, so you wouldn't be able to make... Uh, so, oh, what the heck. Okay, let's go on ahead and give you a quick tour of what's going on here at La Gringa. There's our big beastie in the background, powered by the solar panels. We're not alone on this beach because it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, just look at it. This is what we've had out our front window for the last couple of weeks. Although we're only going to be here a couple more days, we're going to have to make a drive back north, cross the border, because we've got some friends and family and some holiday obligations uh, for this Christmas season. So we'll be looking forward to seeing all of them. And speaking of friends and family and holiday folks, did you know it's Cyber Monday right now? Yes, of course it is. And if you're looking for the perfect gift for your friends and family and loved ones, uh, might I suggest heading over to jennifer.net, J-E-N-E-F-E-R.net. That is the Etsy shop for my wife's glass store, and she makes beautiful uh, handcrafted gamer pieces and jewelry and all kinds of other stuff stuff that uh, make 
perfect gifts. And Etsy right now is running a $5 off if you buy on Cyber Monday. I think uh, the code is Cyber24. You'll see it when you get to the page, jennifer.net, J-E-N-E-F-E-R.net. We'll take you there. And uh, yeah, Jen's been making all kinds of stuff while we are on the road. She's been uh, fusing glass out on the beach, having a great old time. And again, if you're looking for a last minute gift, uh, she reckons if you get your order in by December 17th, the post office is guaranteeing delivery. She doesn't, but the post office does, at least for the continental United States. So I uh, just wanted to mention that, folks. And uh, there's a lot of really fun stuff that she very much enjoys making for you. But advertisements out of the way. You want to hear about those games, right? Okay, well, let's get going. Starting with number 13 of the month, Sunrise at the Studio, which is the latest game from publisher Pencil First and designer Steve Finn. This time he was teaming up with uh, Eduardo Baraf, the uh, head of Pencil First Studios. And I gotta say, folks, do not be tricked by the fact that this came in at the bottom of my list this month. This is a lovely, charming game where players take on the role of ceramicists, uh, you know, working the clay on the wheel to make beautiful vases and plates and all kinds of things and the presentation is incredibly charming really evocative and the gameplay is sharp here's the crux of it um every round you're going to draw four cards and these represent different types of clay or glaze or whatever you might need to make the various and sundry uh, pieces of pottery that you're trying to create but here's the trick you have to decide each round after you draw these four cards are you going to work carefully or sloppily or a third one. I don't remember the exact three terms, but there's three different ways you could work. And what that means is how many of those cards you're going to get and collect to be able to work on the projects you're working on and how many of those cards you're going to give to your opponent. Uh, if you've got a bunch of cards, oh, these are all perfect for me. Uh, so I want to grab as many of them as I can. That means you're going to give more to your opponent. Uh -huh. Or if like, oh, this is a terrible hand. I don't like any of these. Or, oh, but there is a one that's really good for you. All right, well, I'm going to work in a way that means that half of those cards just go away. And so you make this decision every turn. How many cards are you keeping for yourself? How many cards are you giving to your opponent as you um, set collect the right type of, uh, what should I call it, collect? and all the rest of it to make these uh, beautiful works of art. And uh, heck, if you get some stuff that doesn't work for you, well, you can kind of save it in your storeroom and combine things because stuff can be converted two to one into whatever you might need. It is a sharp, fun little game. There's a fair dash of luck, but you really have a lot of control over the luck because when you don't get the cards you want, well, that's when hopefully you've set aside your ability to trash those cards instead of handing them to your opponent or whatever it might be. Charming, fast playing, very lightweight though. I um, mean, there's nothing wrong with this game, but this is very much a casual you know, gateway, family-friendly style game. And generally, Jen and I are looking for heavier fare, which is what brings it in at the bottom. But if you like the subject matter and you just want a nice, relaxing, um, chilled back, laid back afternoon of beautiful gaming, you might want to check out number 13 of the month, Sunrise at the studio. And I should say, by the way, folks, uh, this is a run-through done by my good buddy, Aurel Gaviola. There'll be a link down in the show notes if you want to watch him playing so you can get a better idea of what the game feels like. And there's going to be links for everything I talk about today down in the show notes. Okay, now let's move on to number 12 of the month. What do we got here? It is fairy ring. Now, this is a uh, new, simple, light, fast weight card drafting game where every turn uh, you're going to take one mushroom, hand the rest over to your neighbor, and then play it onto your board. You've seen this in a million games. You know, this is a pass and play drafting game. But things really get interesting once you've decided what mushroom you're going to add to your little fairy kingdom. You can either extend existing mushrooms you've got or create new mushrooms in front of you. So you're going to have a few mushrooms that are very powerful, very tall, or a bunch of mushrooms that aren't very powerful. But that's only half of it. After you've played the uh, card you kept, you've got a little fairy token that travels clockwise around the board between your little fairy village and every other mushroom village as well. It's your basically players are working together to make a big rondelle. And the trick is the card I played, well, that let me build my mushroom village the way I wanted to, but it also says 
how far will my fairy creature move, my little bumblebee or whatever I am. And the trick is, I want to move in such a way that I have them visit my village to activate my mushrooms. And I want them to completely skip your village and not activate any of your mushrooms. Unless, here's the trick, if I know I'm only going to be able to move a little ways and it's going to go into your village and you're going to get to activate some stuff in yours, which means you're going to get a benefit for what I did. If I activate a mushroom that's in your village, but I've got that same type of mushroom, I'll activate it in mine as well. And maybe my version of that mushroom is even better than yours. So if, as I'm moving through your village, I'm trying to target specific spots that will benefit me more than you. But that means I've got to play certain cards that let me move five steps or three steps or whatever. But maybe I don't want to play those cards because that's not the mushroom I want to add to my village. It's a clever game, very fast, very fun. Um, every type of mushroom has a different way of scoring. There's a lot of variation, a lot of variety, and it's just a fun, fast playing little game that I think anybody's going to enjoy. And quite frankly, Jen and I enjoyed it quite a bit too. So why did it come in at um, number 12 of the month? This game works as a two-player game. It works perfectly well. I uh, enjoyed it quite a bit, but I got to say, it's going to be so much better with at least three players where you have to make that tough traversal um, between two or three players' villages before you eventually make it back to your own. As a two-player game, oh, I may be dabbling your village a little bit, but I could very easily, um, you know, I could target what I need to target much more straightforwardly, with, you know, by, and there wasn't as much tension as there would. This is the perfect card, but I'm going to have to help you all. But you're in last place anyway. I don't mind giving you a better reward, just as long as I don't give Jen, because I'm going to go through her village next. The more villages around the table, the bigger the rondelle you have to navigate before you get back to uh, your home base is going to be so much more interesting. And so, while I would happily play this as a two-player game anytime, it's a fun experience, it's going to be so elevated as soon as you get that third player, or your fourth player, or whatever. So, great little game. If you like drafting, if you like nice presentation, I highly recommend checking out number 12 of the month, Fairy Ring. I think this is going to be a lot of people's favorite game of the year, quite frankly, folks. It's one to look for and it's flying totally under the radar. Okay, now let's go on to number 11 on the list. It is AI 100% human. And I should say, by the way, uh, I have not done a full run-through of it. I'm showing a, a live stream that uh, YouTuber Boogie did. It's a great one. It's in English. Uh, you know, uh, I've talked about this in the roundup before, and last time there were only French run-throughs. Now you can actually watch an English-speaking run-through if you want. Boogie did a great job. Links down in the show notes. Why am I talking about this game again when I've already done it in a previous roundup? Well, the last time I talked about it, I had only played it as a three-player game, or maybe it was even four-player game, at uh, Dice Tower West Convention Library. And so I was mostly talking about it as a higher player count game. I've now got a final copy of it. I brought it with us on the road in the RV, and Jen and I have played it as a two-player game. And it has dropped a few points for me because I think it's a very good two-player game. In fact, it's an well, it's an excellent any player uh, count. But my super super high best of the year potential ranking I gave it was as a three or more player game. Because here's the thing: as a two-player game, the way this card drafting works, it's a Seven Wonders style drafting where I'm gonna you know take a card for myself, hand the rest on. Although there's more to it than that because the card I take, I don't have to play. It goes into my personal reserve. And I might, at any given time, I've got three cards in my reserve. I'm going to, every turn, I'm going to add one card to my reserve. So I've got three, and then I'm going to pick one card. And then I'm going to score that card immediately. And that creates so much tense, tension and angst, but so much control. It's brilliant. I love the core idea here. And as a three player game, it's great. So why am I, is it knocking down? Why is it coming? One of the best drafting games I've played in years. When I talked about this last time, I said it has the potential to supplant Seven Wonders for me as a card drafting game. So why is it coming in at um, number 11? Now that I play as a two-player game, my preferred player count, the way they've implemented two-player drafting is very cutthroat. It's kind of um, you know reminiscent of Among the Stars 
or uh, Green Valley. This idea that, hey, I picked my card I'm keeping for myself. Now I'm going to trash a card. And then a new one's going to get drawn, and then I hand it over to you. So every round, not only am I picking what I want, but I'm picking what do you want that I am going to destroy and remove from the game. And now I've played other games like this. I'm not crazy about it. This is kind of how Seven Wonders two-player works back when it was officially a two-player game. The thing is, this game is so crunchy so brilliantly puzzly that it is everything I can do just to focus on my own little puzzle, trying to figure out how to play my 3 by 5 grid of cards and maximize the scoring potential of them. In a two-player game, now I have to pay equal eagle-eye attention to your tableau because I've got to pick every round. What card am I going to destroy? So I need to know what's most valuable for you. And this so slows down and bogs down the game. It just becomes too much. Um, and I just wish, 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 wish they had come up with a different mode for the two-player draft, where every turn I did not have to figure out, right, of these remaining three cards or four cards or whatever, which one should I destroy to keep it from going to you? Not a fan. Again, I would, I would go anywhere, anytime to play this as a three or more player game because it is literally one of the best games of 2024. One of the best card drafting, puzzling, tableau building games of all time. And if you don't mind, it's suddenly becoming literally twice as complex and much more cutthroat. Well, then it's made for you as a two player game too. But for me and Jen, that really kind of knocked it down a couple of pegs. And so my updated two player um, roundup of AI 100% human, well, it comes in at number 11 of the month. All right. Now, let's go on to number 10 of the month, Thorgal. Um, now, I do not have a run-through. I am using a run-through from a Polish channel, I believe. What is the name of this channel? It is... Uh, it's something in Polish. Uh, Plan Zawik Online TV. Plan Zawik Online TV. I'm sure that's entirely wrong. Again, there's a link for this down in the show notes if you'd like to go see this game in action. I just thought their run-through did a really good job of, uh, even if it's in Polish, I believe it's Polish, showing off the, um, uh, the, 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 components of the game, the art of the game, and all that. Uh, it's just a nice open view. It was the best looking video I could find to show what this game looks like in action. But, how does it play in action? And why did it come in at number 10? Well, this is the latest from uh, publisher Portal Games. And uh, it is a cooperative game set in a very, very popular Viking comic series, which I've never read before, but apparently it's been around for a long time. I forget, it either comes with five or six unique um, missions you can play. Kind of like Imagine Pandemic had six different missions you could choose from. Uh, this is not a... Um, or what do you call it, a campaign game where you go from chapter to chapter to chapter and level up your characters. It, or it's like Legends of Andor. You just pick any chapter you want to play, uh, play it. There's going to be random setup every time you play, so there's going to be replayability. But what is it? Well, you and your teammates are working cooperatively to solve some type of problem. Like in uh, this particular one, our airship has crashed in a strange land. We have to repair it while dealing with the uh, political turmoil between two warring um, states and the rebellion. And you have to pick one side. Are you going to support the rebellion or the first king or the second king? Or though they were sister queens, as I recall correctly. As you travel around the board and collect the resources you need to repair your flying ship and get the heck out of Dodge. So, and you know, all the missions have, I, I guess these are based on famous stories from the comic book. You know, they're very evocative. You play on a big storybook uh, with, where the map is different every time, and you travel around, you interact with different areas, you, you find out what, the, uh, what you have to do, and you deal with problems along the way. And now, so we've seen this in a lot of games. Um, but, what really makes this game stand out is how you do all these actions. There are two very big fundamental game changers. It, you have never played a, um, a cooperative adventure game, board game like this ever before. Because the first thing is the way you pick actions. Um, right, I'm just going to pause for a second because they keep cutting back and forth to zoom ins on the uh, player. The, uh, every time you play, you've got a collection of cards that represent the different actions you can do. And they're laid out in a specific way from left to right. And on your turn, you're going to take one of these action tokens and put it on one of those actions to indicate 
dictate what you're going to do, whether it's move around, whether it's collect resources, whether it's, you know, try, interact with the environment, whether it's, you know, explore the environment. There's, you know, several different things you can do. It's a different combination of things. And the layout of these cards matter because what most of these actions, as say, if I choose uh, this action, you know, right over here, the I think that's the one that lets me harvest stuff from the area. I'll be able, you know, every area I've been, oh, this area lets me get lumber. This area lets me get rumors or whatever it might be. And it changes from mission to mission, the types of things you're harvesting, what you use them for. But say I'm going to harvest, right? Now, here's the thing. If I harvest, I just get to do a little level one harvest. I don't get much stuff. But if I wait until one of my teammates activates one of the other actions to the left, like the explore action or the um, interact action or something like that, every action to the right want to harvest until somebody else explores because then that'll make this harvest a double action or a triple action or a quadruple action. So the puzzle of this game deciding what at order actions are going to be done and who's going to do them because different players have different strengths is so fascinating. It's really a very interesting puzzle to work out. I need to do this action now, but it's going to be really weak. Can I do something else while I'm waiting? Or heck, maybe if you can get over here, you could harvest the rumors we need to make it over to the pub to um, you know, you know, solve the problem and spread the information or whatever. I love this action selection mechanism. Uh, one of the coolest things I've ever seen in cooperative adventure board games, quite frankly. This is not the regular pandemic, oh, it's your turn, spend four action points, however you want. This game, it's so much more engaging. But that's just half of it. The second half, well, it's shown right here on screen. Um, when you deal with a problem, usually fighting or other things as well, um, but usually fighting, you um, draw a card that represents the uh, struggle you've got. You roll the dice, and those dice, depending on how leveled up, you can roll better and better dice. They give you different polyomino um, tiles. And so in this case, they're going to get a red five-piecer and a blue, it's either a one-piecer or, if they can get a critical hit, a three-piecer. You take these pieces, which I assume the player is going to do. Oh, they're re-rolling because they're trying to get a better one. Now they've got a five and a two. Now they've got to tile lay those on the fight card. You need to cover up all the enemy hit points without covering up the things that will hurt you. And if you can cover it up correctly, you can also give yourself bonuses like extra experience points so you can level up and whatnot. So every time you fight, it's a cool little mini tile laying puzzle. And of course, you can get all kinds of powers that let you change the pieces you get and all of that. And it's a lot of fun. Now, if you take damage in a fight, you end up having to collect um, those polyomino tile layers and cover up your own little um, area of the board. The more damage you take, the harder it is to puzzle those. It's like it's like um, turning a jigsaw puzzle, like three different jigsaw puzzles uh, simultaneously into an, a cooperative adventure game. It's so cool. And if that's not all, well, I said one of the actions you can do is you can explore the area in, and that means taking polyomino pieces and spreading them out on this series. Let's go on ahead and zip a little bit further in the game. You'll see the explore as they explore more. Come on. Come on. Oh, I went too far. The game is over. As, you, as they explore more, you can see they can explore further and further and further to the right, covering up actions, again, with polyomino tiles. Um, to get all kinds of benefits and try to avoid danger. So that's it. There are, at any given time, there's the polyomino tile laying puzzle of your own board when you take damage, the polyomino tile laying communal puzzle as we both try to explore our way through this series of cards, and the polyomino tile laying puzzle that you'll deal with every once in a while when you get into a fight. So that is three jigsaw polyomino puzzle games you're playing while also playing one of the coolest action selection games I've ever seen. So there's a lot, a lot of really cool elements in this game. And I liked it quite a bit. So um, why then did it come in at number 10 of the month? Well, as much as I love all these mechanisms, my least favorite thing about the game was the actual adventures themselves, which feature a fair amount of, oh, traveling from one place to another, getting a thing, taking it back, dealing with fights along the way. And, you know, this stuff was fine. There was nothing wrong with it. But it was literally... Um, all the mechanisms to do the adventure were amazing. The adventures themselves were okay. 
Um, you know, I'm kind of, it's hard for me not to draw comparisons between this and Legends of Andor. And the main thing about Legends of Andor, it has a lot of, hey, run around and fight things and roll dice and get stuff and take it where you need to go. But, um, it happens very quickly. You can travel very far, very fast, and there's lots of really tough puzzles of which monsters to fight and whatnot. This game, the adventure portion, the traveling around the world, I mean, I loved everything about this game, except I only just thought, the adventure part was okay. Now, I think other people would love this kind of stuff. If you like pick up and uh, pick up and deliver adventure styles with fighting done in a way that you've never seen before, you're probably going to love Thorgal a lot more than we did. We love the mechanisms. We liked the adventure, and so that combination came in a little bit lower. If, um, but I'm I, honestly, I would love to try this again with um, something to just speed up the adventure element, quite frankly. Uh, you know, and be a little bit less pick up and deliver, a little bit more focusing on the really cool mechanisms of the game. But folks, uh, you know, there are some playthroughs. Um, One Stop Co-op Shop did a great playthrough as well. Uh, so you can, uh, I think it might be this adventure again. This is, I think, the third adventure. Um, should I, you know, I should have been showing the One Stop uh, The problem is the One, co one Stop co-op shop video never showed the whole board they spend the entire time zoomed in so i figured i would show this so i could show you what the game looks like set up more broadly but anyway maybe i'll put a link for the one-stop co-op shop run through down in the show notes as well so you can see it in english or in polish i think a lot of people are really gonna dig this game jen and me we're just very persnickety very picky about the adventures we play and that's why thorgal comes in at number 10 but again these mechanisms are so freaking brilliant Okay, now let's go on to number nine of the month. What have we got here? It's Dungeon Legends, which I uh, filmed along with Jen as our monthly rest and relax video for members on YouTube or Patreons. If you want to see this in action, well, maybe you uh, might want to support the channel, but that's okay. I'm just going to let you know what it's all about. This is a cooperative fantasy uh, dungeon crawling adventure that is heavy on the deck building Euro mechanisms. Um, because every time you play, the whole dungeon is laid out right in front of you. And honestly, if I were to draw any comparisons with any other game, I'd have to be, it'd have to be Clank. Um, now, don't get me wrong. This is very different. This is cooperative. Clank is competitive. But this is a fantasy deck building game where you start out with a deck of cards that gets you to do various things like fight and um, travel, you know, move around and, you know, harvest resources. Uh, it, it, they don't call it mana in this game. They call it dust because I guess it's set in the Avel uh, fantasy uh, adventure series. And on your turn, you're going to have a hand of five cards, and you're going to decide how to play them, and you're going to use them to move around from location to location in the dungeon. And every time you play, you're going to get a unique dungeon, because the game comes with, like, I forget, a half a dozen different scenarios. Uh, like, the dungeon is on fire, and you're stopping the spread of fire. Or there's thieves in the mines trying to steal the gems that you have to, you know, mine yourself. Or uh, the uh, constellations are moving through the nighttime sky and changing the rules of the game as you go. There's a bunch of different missions. But um, all of them uh, start with, was it one, two, three, four, five, six unique rooms, a combination of rooms that uh, you can move back and forth in the dungeon to interact with those rooms to do various and sundry things. That's along the bottom of the board. Now, along the top of the board is a conveyor belt of doom because at the beginning of your turn, or I should say at the end of your turn, you're going to draw a new card. And this deck of cards of 30 cards is the timer for the game. So 30 turns and the game is over. You're going to draw a card and most of the time that's going to make a monster come out and that means all the other monsters stream to the right and get closer and closer to the castle and if any of them breach the castle we lose so a big part of this game is depending on what cards you have to play in a given turn is traveling back and forth dealing with obstacles like cave-ins or whatever to get into the right position to attack monsters and prevent them from overrunning the castle while also dealing with whatever your big overarching goal is while also dealing 
dealing with the fact that every time you play these rooms that you can use to interact to like lay traps or um you know open secret passages or whatever it might be they're going to be in different locations every time so it's kind of almost like hey what if pandemic had a totally randomized world map every time you played and um and then it had a conveyor belt and folks i've said this many many times in the roundup i love conveyor belts they are one of my favorite mechanisms because they're so easy to see um but you know this is a conveyor belt where your character literally travels along the conveyor belt to um you know oh, I've, th that's the monster i've got to kill if i try to fight these other monsters they'll retaliate and knock me out but if i can take out this it'll buy us time for you to be able to uh get into position with your bow and take out the one that's really bothering us so i can take out this one right now and block you know basically put a throw a wrench into the conveyor belt temporarily to buy us the time we need while also interacting with the room and laying a trap for later on this game starts out very simple you've just got a simple deck of cards but every time almost every time you beat a monster you get these cool holographic um you know print style cards to add to your deck that give you bigger and better more powerful moves you can do so you're leveling up very very fast doing all kinds of deck building and all kinds of and as the game goes on and more and more monsters are out there and you're in more and more stress and you're running out of time because you've only got 30 turns to do whatever your main objective is and you're getting closer to dying and if you die don't worry uh you'll heal back up you'll go back to the castle you can go out again but you lose a turn in a game where you only have 30 turns to get what done losing a turn is super dangerous it's really, really good. It's a lot of fun. I enjoyed it a lot. There's a lot of variety, replayability within the different missions, but the fact that there are, again, there are five or six different missions, all with different rules, um, it's really, really sharp. I liked it quite a bit. I really only have one complaint about it. It's a little on the long side. Uh, you know, Jen and I found, you know, our first game of this, the one I'm recording here playing, this took us like almost two hours. And the second time we played a different mission, um, that one took us close to 90 minutes. Now, maybe if we keep playing it more and more, um, you know, we could get it down to, I mean, this feels like it should be under an hour. And it's not. Uh, because for the good reasons that this game is very, very crunchy. And it's designed to say, okay, it's designed so that you'll just barely get it done in under the 30 minutes if you'll pull off a win. Or if you if you lose, it's probably because you're going to run out of time. Um, and... Honestly, I just wish that deck of 20 or 30 cards you have to play through was a deck of 20 cards and the, the whole thing was rebalanced so it would last 20 rounds because this is a fun game. It's a blast from start to finish, but these days, Jen and I find we want a co-op game that's going to be in and out in under an hour. And this one's not. This is more like an hour and a half. And um, for us, that just makes it a little bit too long. I, I mean, I, I, but the the deck building again you know i i've got to put it right there side by side with clank clank does such a wonderful job um with you know fantasy adventure deck building uh, as a competitive thing this one works just as well but as a cooperative game and if you're looking for a longer co-op game you know something's going to be around 30 percent longer than an uh you know a uh, the loop or pandemic or um you know something like that if, if that fits your time frame this one is worth checking out because that conveyor belt of doom puts so much pressure on you the deck building is so sharp and the replayability just the cleverness there are so many clever design twists and tricks in this game it's very very impressive i think a lot of people are really going to fall in love with number nine of the month dungeon legends Okay, now let's go on to number eight. What am I going to be talking about? It's Imperium Horizons. Now, I covered Imperium Legends and Classics a few years ago, and this is the third in the Imperium series. Uh, you can see here uh, Maggie of uh, Thinker Themer. She did a phenomenal solo run through of this. It's on the channel. If you go follow the links down in the show notes if you want to check it out. But um, I finally got a chance to play it with Jen. And this is just as brilliant. Uh, in fact, this is better. Everything I laid praise on the original Imperium Classics and Legends, everything gets better here. Um, it comes with, I forget, a ton. Like, was it like 12? 
10 or 12 or 14, a lot of new civilizations we can play through with a ton of asymmetry between them. They all play differently. They all feel so unique. So you're going to get so much replayability built in this box with the, uh, at times, extreme um, yeah, asymmetry between, oh, I should say this is a, uh, you know, a, a civilization building deck builder where everybody's trying to build up the best civilization they can. Um, and again, I've covered it a lot on the channel. You can go watch it in action. What makes it really stand out um, well, there's several things. Um, uh, probably the most important thing to talk about, though, is why it comes in at number eight of the month, is its extreme complexity. The, uh, you know, the Imperium series is one of the heaviest games, certainly maybe the heaviest deck builder there is in the industry, period. Uh, it is so far above and beyond a Dominion or... Um, I mean, it's up there with Mage Knight, the board game. Uh, and that's great. It doesn't probably, it's not a problem for me at all. I love the depth and the complexity. And it's a tough game to play. It's a tough game to get your head around. There's so much going on with this game. So many special keywords, so many rules you have to keep track of, and um, a really crunchy puzzle to solve every turn. But my wife does not like this game at all. Uh, and so, unfortunately, I could only ever really play it as a solo game. And so, uh, if if I if this would rank so much higher for me if Jen enjoyed playing it, so I could play it as a two player game. But I'm taking her into account, so it's coming in at number eight. Uh, if she loved it as much as me, this would probably be my number two ranked game of the month. Uh, and especially, I, I I kind of got away from what I was starting to say. This is such a quantum leap improvement over the previous Imperium games because it does two things. One, it introduces an express mode that cuts down the length of the game by, I don't know, about 20%. And this is a long game. So anything that can be done to let us skip through those early... The, the beginning of every game, it's going to take a while before you get up and running. And so this express mode, which by the way is backwards compatible, you can just download the rules for uh, Horizons and use this express mode in Legends and Classics. But it makes the game so much better. I would never not play with this trick where basically it's as if you've already gone through your deck twice and added two new cards to your deck and the timer gets shorter so the game is just going to go so much quicker. Huge improvement. Must play that way. I love that. But what I love even more is they've added a whole new mechanism uh, called trade where... Some of the cards you can invest and build your civilization are trade route cards. And what that means is on a future turn, either I or any of my opponents can use their trade action to put trade goods on that card and activate super powerful moves. And the coolest part is, yeah, I, mean, I can use my own trade card, but you can use my trade card as well. If I use my own trade card, my trade goods go away. I, I pump them into the trade and um, that's it. I've, I've run out of trade goods. Now I got to go get more trade goods before I can engage in trade again. And trade goods can be hard to get. They're expensive. But if instead I use trade to send my trade goods to your um, to your tra uh, you know trade route card, you'll get those trade goods. I'll get the special power of your card and I'll get a new trade good from the supply. So the game heavily, heavily incentivizes and encourages play you know, collaborative play between opponents. And I love that. And I also love that to play with this trade um, route mode, you have to remove most of the um, attack cards in the game because, oh, you don't attack each other. You still can. There are still some attack cards in the game, but most of them are removed and replaced with positive interaction. And this has got to be one of the best systems for interaction between players in a competitive game, even in a two-player game where it's zero sum. It is, it is almost always better for you to engage in trade with your opponent rather than yourself because that keeps your engine going faster and you don't slow yourself down, but you also help your opponent. I love it. And so it breaks my heart so much that Jen did not love it. So this is one of the greatest solo deck building card games of all time. This is one of the greatest, um, you know, competitive, co uh, you know, super crunchy deck building games of all time. This is one of the greatest civilization building games of all time. But unfortunately, because my number one gaming partner in the world just doesn't enjoy it, I'm going to have to knock it down a few pegs because it is at times absurdly complex. Make no mistake about it. But me, I love that complexity. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag. Coming in at number eight of the month is Imperium.
horizons. Okay, now let's move on to number seven of the month, Star Trek Captain's Chair. And I tell you, folks, as it says right there, you know, in the tagline for my run through that I've done uh, for the game, uh, this was my most anticipated game of my entire lifetime. Or certainly board and card game. I think the only game I've ever anticipated more than this were the games that I myself worked on back when I was a video game designer. So yeah, Siphon Filter and The Sims and Fable 2 and Brink were more anticipated. But putting aside my own personal games, I was just anticipating shipping. There's never been a, another game, card game, board game, video game, um, that I've ever been more excited to play than this one. Because... This, it's like this game was designed in a lab for me. I am one of the biggest Star Trek nerds you will ever see in all of board game them. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not quite to the level where I've gotten every name of every episode memorized, or I could just at a glance tell you, oh, that's, oh, that episode, that title? Yeah, that's when they went to, um, Navidium 3 or whatever. I can't remember the planet names, I can't remember the episode names, but I remember everything else my entire life. I have been loving Star Trek growing up as a child of the 70s right up to the modern day with uh, Discovery and Lower Decks and Strange New Worlds. Uh, I'm, I, I've always loved Star Trek. And anytime there's a new Star Trek game, I've got to try it out. I also really, really love deck building. And I also really, really love big, crunchy, heavy, complicated games. So here's what Star Trek Captain's Chair is. Uh, a heavy, incredibly crunchy, incredibly complex Star Trek-themed game um, that because of thematic reasons can pull from every corner of Star Trek lore. Can pull from any show, any movie, other than the Kelvinverse movies. Uh, and um, it's uh, going to mix and match stuff because we're basically in the far, in the, was it, the 32nd century, Starfleet is training new cadets and they've got a, uh, a simulation where you can recruit captains and ships and locations and famous crew members and everything to basically do a new version of the Kobayashi Maru. That's how they train in the 32nd century uh, of Star Trek Captain's Chair. So I love the, the story this tells that lets you just mix and match. What I said in my video, this is like fantasy football for Star Trek nerds. You get to pick all your favorite captains and ships and uh, villains and everything and mash them all together to try to win the game. And I love that so much. That's what I'm saying. It's made for me. And on top of that, this uses the core gameplay of the Imperium card system. I've talked about Imperium so much on this channel. I love it to pieces. One of the greatest modern card designs of all time. An incredibly rich, heavy, crunchy game. I just finished talking about it, though. And so, um, you know what my problem with Imperium is. My number one gaming partner in the world, Jen, hates Imperium because it's too complicated. And if anything, Star Trek Captain's Chair gets more complex more opaque, more challenging. Every card you play, almost every card you play, has like four or five different uses. Um, that Sometimes we use action points, sometimes don't. Sometimes they have to be deployed using the powers of other cards. Sometimes they can be played directly. And as the game goes on, and it goes on for a long time, because unlike Imperium Horizons, this one does not have a turbo mode, and I don't understand why it would have been so easy to transplant the Horizons uh, Express mode into this game. Uh, if you watch my final thoughts, you'll explain. I, I explain how to do it. It would totally work. I'm sure it'll fit, become an official variant eventually. But Jen hated this game, and that's what broke my heart. Um, because again, it's just too much. And like Imperium before, this game goes so way over the edge. Way, I mean, forget about the deep end of the pool. This just throws you into the ocean and says, figure it out, bud. And I love it. Because I love a big, heavy, crunchy game. But for my wife, Jen, it is too heavy, too crunchy. She wanted to love it. We played this several times, which is an ode, a testament to how good this game is and how strongly thematically grounded it is. But Jen just said, no, I'm never going to get used to this game. This game is absurdly complex because it takes the already over-the-top depth and complexity of Imperium and ratchets it up like three more levels. So you should know if this is a game for you. Because if you, I mean, this is going to be probably one of the heaviest games Jen and I have ever played. And me, I want to come back for second and thirds and fourth. I want to throw myself into it. It's got an amazing solo mode. Uh, and it's, by the way, I should say, it's only a one or a two player game. Unlike Imperium, where you could play at higher player counts, not here. It's only for doubles players. And it's phenomenal. 
Um, I would say it is better than the Imperium Serium, except it's not a system, but it's not because the Imperium system, one, has the express mode from Imperium Horizons, and two, has the brilliant trade mode where you can throw away most of the attack cards. This game can be very attacky. There's no two ways about it. I'm willing to overlook that as a Care Bear player because I love it so much, but there's just too much stacked against it. It is not going to stay in my collection. It's going to go to the Dice Tower West Library, and if you play it there, you'll be playing my very well-loved copy, and I wish I could play it with you folks. But really, I wish I could play it with my wife, Jen. Uh, this, I don't know if it's officially going to come out in 2024 or 2025. For my taste, this is the best game of either 2024 or 2025, whenever it eventually comes out. But I'm not going to keep it because it's one of my wife's least favorite games because it's just too much. It's just too much. You got to know that going in. Uh, but, oh, it is so good. I love it so much. Uh, like I said, this would be my game of the month. Except, I uh, for me, this is only a solo game. I'll never get a chance to play it other than solo, and I'm not a solo gamer. So I guess I'm really kind of ranking this mostly as a solo game. Comes in at number seven of the month, Star Trek Captain's Chair. I am so tempted just to keep it for solo mode. I love it so much. And that's a rare thing, folks. I don't have any solo games. But I'm 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 still I'm torn. I'm torn. But anyway, I gotta move on. Let's move on now. Shall we? To number of the month, which has not been number six of the month for me is SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, which is an excellent game from new designer Thomas Hollock. I already covered Thomas's other two games that came out this year, T Garden and Galileo Galilei. And now I've played SETI. I've played all three. What an amazing debut year for this designer. I've already done the run through. You can check it out. Links down in the show notes and all of that. This is a game where, set in the modern day where we're using real world technology to engage in the search for extraterrestrial life. And in this game, we're going to find it. We're going to launch probes from Earth to all the planets and moons of the solar system looking for traces of life. We are going to scan the nighttime sky, um, looking for, you know, searching for data. And then we're going to crunch that data through supercomputers to find uh, traces of life. And eventually you're going to find enough traces of life and everybody's racing to be the first to find it. And that will reveal alien species. There's going to be two different alien species, a combination of two alien species every time you play, then when they get discovered are going to change the, or add to the rules of the game uh, so that we can score points in different ways by uh, first contact and stuff like that. But um, what drives this game is a wonderful multi-use card system. And you know me, I love multi-use cards. In this game, you got a handful of cards and you can discard these cards as a free action to get resources when you need them. Uh, you can tuck these cards under your, um, your, your uh, space agency to turn them into income for the rest of the game or you can play them. When you play them, they let you do stuff like launch probes or turn probes into landers or orbitals around uh, other planets, or they let you, you know, scan the nighttime sky or um, you'll upgrade your, your landers or your telescopes or all kinds of things. But the interesting thing is most of the time you want to play the cards to do the actions, right? Once you play a card to do an action, usually they stick around and they become a little mission for you to complete. So not only do you use these cards at the right time, to uh, you know, do the right actions, but you also use them to give yourself new mini. I love little bite-sized mini missions. Ever since Hollertau made me fall so hard in love with them, and this game does them so smartly because, hey, I want to play this card right now, but I'm not going to be able to finish this mission. I might never finish this mission because it's a mission for something I'm not really doing, but I really want to play this card. Am I going to waste it? Are we going to find some other way to do that action? The multi-use cards in this game are super duper sharp. The um, tech leveling upgrading is super sharp. The fact that every time you play, you don't know, you know what the rules are at the start, but you don't know what the unique rules are going to be because you don't know what aliens are going to show up. One will show up midway through the game. One will show about a third of the way into the game. One will show up two thirds of the way into the game and they will create new rules, new opportunities. Uh, and then, oh, I didn't even mention, I buried the lead. At the center of the board is the solar system. And every turn, the solar system has three different dials in either the inner planets, you know, Earth, 
Venus and Mercury, or the middle planets, uh, Jupiter, Mars, etc., or the outer planets, Saturn and Uranus, are going to rotate. And so all the planets are going at different speeds, and you've got to you've got to move fast because the because the solar system is in motion. What right now you might have a great launch window to do that mission out to Jupiter, and you've got an objective to get to Jupiter. And if you don't get it done quick, the solar system is going to change, and um, now it's going to be very very hard to get to Jupiter. It'll be a long time before your launch window comes up again. I love that thematic verisimilitude. I, I love everything about this game, except for one thing. There is one element that is an area majority. Uh, when you scan the nighttime sky, you're trying to do area majority stuff. And every most everything else about this game has done really, really well to scale to different player counts. There's a dummy player who um, you know pitches in on trying to discover the aliens because in a two-player game without at least a third player, it's going to take longer than it should to discover the aliens because only two players doing the work of three players it would slow down. So they had a really great system to speed that up. But they did not apply that system to the area majority game. And the area majority game of scanning the skies to get data about signs of life as a two-player game, it suffers. It's not as good as it should be. It still works. It's just nowhere near as much fun as it would be with three or more players. And it just breaks my heart that Thomas and the developers of CG just didn't do a tiny bit more work to make um, the area majority game have a dummy player. I talked about this in my final thoughts. I had, I think, a very good suggestion for how it could work using a system that's already in the game. And if they had done that, this would probably be in my top three games of the month. Now, all that said, it's still in my top six months, uh, six games of the month. It's still very, very good, but it is sadly my least favorite of the three Thomas Hollick games. I'd probably rank them Tea Garden, then Galileo Galilee, and then this. But this would be the number one if they just done the tiniest bit of extra work for the two-player mode to emulate a third player vying for the area majority. Or, uh, and I, I say this because last month, was it last month I talked about World Order, which is another game. You can play it two or more, and it's a big part of the game is area majority. And World Order did such a brilliant system, a brilliant system for um, making the area majority more interesting by having dummy players. I wish they had done that here, and they didn't. And so that's why SETI comes in at number six of the month when it should have been. For everything else about this game, it should have been much, much higher. All righty. Now, let's talk about number five of the month, Tree Society. This is the latest design from one of my favorite design duos, uh, Dunstan and Gilbert. I recently talked about them in my most updated favorite designers of all time. They finally made the list. Ever since Elysium, I have so loved what these guys do. Uh, you know, and then Guild of Merchant Explorers really nailed it. Uh, those are both top 10 of the year candidates. I don't think Tree Society is, but Tree Society is very, very good. And it kind of gives me Elysium vibes a little bit because every time you, or I should say, this is, what would you call it? I guess it's an economic game, right? Well, okay, let me tell you what you do every turn. We are all members of the Tree Society, this kind of fantastical group of artisans and explorers and scientists and merchants who have all decided to go out and build a society amongst the trees. We're building tree houses that we're going to live in. It's kind of a fantastical universe. I mean, heck, this could be maybe set in the Guild of Merchant Explorers. Now I think about it, and the merchants of Merchant Explorers are just one of the factions. You know what? In my head canon, this is now, as far as I'm concerned, a C Oh, no, it's from a different publisher, so it's not. But anyway, you get it doesn't matter. So on your turn, um, you have a handful of fruits picked from the trees. You're going to sell one fruit to make money. And then you're going to spend that money to upgrade buildings you're already constructing or start constructing new buildings. Once you have constructed usually around four or five buildings all the way to the top level, that'll trigger the end of the game. So we're in a race to build these buildings. And every time we either start a building or upgrade a building, it unlocks a huge collection of different special powers. Instant abilities, in-game scoring opportunities, ongoing abilities, all kinds of stuff. And the crux of the game is getting, building the right combination of buildings so that they can start comboing off each other. Because this one will give me a discount on that one. And when I upgrade that one, it'll let me build another one for free. And hey, the one I can build will actually feed back into the first one and all kinds of stuff. 
the building of these buildings, um, you can see here, right there, there's there's the market. There's three that are at regular price, and then there's three more that are more expensive. You're always trying to eyeball the next building you want to get and start building so it can combo with the buildings you're already building. Each one has three different levels. The more you can put into them, the more points they're worth. And so that's where the rubber hits the road. That's the puzzle of the game. That's what I love. But there's the first half of your turn where, first of all, you have a handful of fruit cards and you sell one to make money so that you can invest in these buildings. Now, this is the weird part of the game. This is the unusual part of the game. It's going to be surprising to a lot of people because the way it works is, say I've got well, right now in this game, I've got two apples, a grape, and a blueberry. And if I look around the board, I've got two apples. Jen, my opponent, has no apples, and there's no apples in the market. So that means there's only two apples in the entire economy right now, which means if I want to sell an apple, I'll make two bucks. If I want to sell those grapes, there are one, two. If I want to sell those blueberries, well, actually, at this point in the game, if I sell any of those things, I'm going to get two bucks. But at a different time, let me jump over here to earlier in this run-through. And by the way, I should say, folks, this is a run-through Jen and I did of the video for members of the channel. Uh, you can subscribe here on YouTube or over at Patreon if you want to watch it in action. But anyway, if I sold my blueberry now, Jen's got one, I've got one, and there's three. So selling blueberries right now is worth five bucks. And then I remove them. So so subsequent sales of blueberries are going to be less and less valuable. So the economy of this game, trying to make money, is so intertwined with everybody else around the table. If I see you've got stuff, I want to sell stuff faster. So because if you know, if I don't sell that blueberry and you sell your blueberry, then my blueberry becomes less valuable. Because we're in a race if you know to get the most money out of these as we can. But here's the trick. Every blueberry or apple or cherry or orange or whatever it is you're going to sell, they all have a special power on them too. And I want to sell this blueberry right now because it'll never be more valuable. I could sell it for five right now. And if I wait and you sell yours, you'll get it for five. And then later on, I'll sell my blueberry for four or maybe even three. It'll just get over time. They get less valuable. But the thing is, the special power on my blueberry... I don't want to activate that power right now because it doesn't do me any good. Um, and so there's always, or not always, sometimes they're pretty easy choices. Sometimes they can be tough choices. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna hope this blueberry holds its value because right now I need to sell this cherry because this is the special power I need to activate to trigger the bonuses I want on my buildings that I'm building. That's the nature of the game, and it's a fun puzzle. Now, the second half of the puzzle, the building of the buildings, is really awesome. I love it. I love it so much. And I also love the fact that every time you play this game, there are six different guilds. I, I mentioned them, the artisans and the explorers and whatnot, and that, which means the different types of buildings you're building, and which means different special powers you're going to get access to. Every time you play, you're going to randomly pick four of those guilds and mix them up. So that's why I said it kind of reminds me of Elysium a little bit, that. Where every time you play, you get a different pantheon and you mix them up. So every time you play, you get a different combination. But then you're playing a very different game than Elysium. I love the buildings. I like the economic game. It's interesting. I have to admit, whenever it puts me into a tough spot where, oh, I want to sell this, but I want to to sell this weaker one so I can get that power right now. That's really interesting. A lot of times, though, it's just always, you know what? Just sell the best thing you can sell. Make the most money you can so you can build your buildings as fast as you can. And I kind of wish <clears throat> the special powers on the fruit cards were a little bit more powerful so the tension was a little bit tougher, that there was a little bit less money in the simulation and a little bit more power on those so that my turns were more often driven, my choices were driven by the power I want to activate instead of the money I can make. Because it's a race. And at the end of the day, I got to make money as fast as I can. So it just kind of misses it a little bit. Don't get me wrong. This is still a great game. I would happily play it anytime, anywhere. I really, really love the building. And I really like the, um, the economy um, you know, sell high game, but, you know, but also figure out the best special powers too. I like everything about it. It continues to make me very, very confident in my choice to put Dunstan and Gilbert on my list of greatest designers, or certainly the greatest design duos of all time. And it comes in at number five of the month, Tree Society. Okay. Now let's go on to number four of the month, Nova Roma. 
another game that I did an exclusive run through for on the channel for Patreons or members. Thank you everybody who helped keep Serato running. Jen and I played it. I did a solo run through of it. And this is the later from designer um, Stan Kordonsky or Stanislav Kordonsky. And Stan is fast, is very quick moving on to my upper echelon of greatest designers of all time too. I have never paid played a bad Stan Kordonsky game. And now that I've played a Nova Roma, I have played all but one of his games. And you know what? I think the wind is picking up here uh, at the beach, and I think I just heard the wind knock over my solar panels. Hold on, I'll be right back. Okay, where was I? Actually, as you can see, we're pulling almost 500 watts now. Hooray, with the uh, solar panels back up. Cool, cool, cool. So, anyway, uh, you're right. yeah, Nova Roma, Nova Roma, uh, Stan Kordonsky is a great, great designer. And I have to admit, this is one of his games that I had passed on uh, because I had heard it was fairly aggressive and take that. And But then uh, somebody else mentioned, Roddy, you should really check it out. You really, really like it. And I'm like, I don't know. Uh, uh, what the heck? Let's give it a try. And so they sent out a copy. And it turns out, yes, as a two-player game, it can be needlessly aggressive and attacky. But... It doesn't need to be. There is an excellent homebrew variant that I came up with that just instantly fixes it. Uh, but let's uh, save that for the end. Here's the deal. This is uh, building up, you know, Rome, as we've done in so many games. Uh, you know, working on trade routes or, uh, you know, entertaining the people within the Hippodrome or, you know, recruiting new followers who have all kinds of special powers and, uh, yeah, and, oh, and building buildings, as we often do in these sorts of games. So there's uh, several different things you're going for, although as part of setup, each player gets a little randomized grid, 3x3 three three grid of a bunch of different objectives. Nine objectives in a 3x3 three three grid they're trying to do. And um, because that's randomized, you're actually trying to complete as many of those as possible, but you need to complete them in rows or columns, because when you complete a row or a column or a diagonal of them, you get extra bonuses. So that kind of gives you a nice incentive direction. There's so many things you can do, but you really focus on you know different kinds of things randomly based on that, which is awesome. Absolutely love that little system. But the actual action selection is where it's really at. There is a 4x4 four four grid in the center of the board. And on your turn, um, you are going to put one of your workers out there and activate the action in the row, at the end of the row, and the column. And those are randomized every time as well. So I might go there and do a recruit and a build, or I might go there and do a hippodrome race and a, and a, and a, tra a boat, or whatever it might be. <clears throat> but here's the trick. At the beginning of every round, the emperor is put out into that grid. And if you can go to the same row or column as the emperor, you, the, the emperor will help you with whatever action that is. So you'll get to do a double race or a double uh, boat or a double recruit or whatever it might be. And on subsequent turns, if you can send your, your workers to the same row or column, they'll help each other as well. So this is a very, very tight little grid, and you want to be able to activate the same row over and over again, uh, ideally off of the Emperor, so you can get bigger, more powerful turns. And that's just really, really sharp, uh, because it's a worker placement game where every spot on the 4x4 grid has two actions, but as it goes on, well, um, spots might disappear. Somebody might go to a spot because they can see, oh, I'm going to do a triple action of that right now. And be like, okay, I'll do a single action of that or a double action. That's cool. Uh, um, and so the worker placement is very, very sharp. Really like that a lot. And like everything else about the game, love the Miko art. Uh, you know, all the different mini games are very nicely considered. The building is particularly nice where when you get enough resources to build a building, they come in polyomino shapes and you to use that shape to put cubes out onto the board for an area majority thing, but you also want to cover areas up to get bonuses. Lots of really good ideas. Really, really sharp. Stan Kordonsky does it again. But now, here was the problem with the game. Here's how it becomes really cutthroat as a two-player game. When you're placing your workers out onto the grid, I put my worker ideally in a place where I'll get to do a double or a triple action, if that's available. And then, after I place my worker, I take a Centurion token and put them in a spot. And the only decision, the only way you can make that decision is decide to put them in a place that is perfect for your opponent and blocks off what they want to do. And that is really mean and nasty and cutthroat for no good reason. Uh, you end up, I mean, each round you uh, place three workers. So each round you also place three centurions, if I recall correctly. I think those are the correct numbers. So you have each round of the, was it five rounds, I think? Or maybe it was four rounds. I think it was five rounds. Might have been four, though. <clears throat> you uh that you just are 
trying to cut your opponent off and, you know, they work really, really hard to be able to do a triple action and say, ha ha, too bad. Nope. You don't get to do that. And it's just awful. It's garbage. There's no good reason for it. Uh, nowhere else in the game is there any kind of take that or nastiness or stealing or anything. But this just becomes a really obnoxious element of the game. So this is why people warned me off of it. And they were right to warn me off of it because that's honestly, in, to my opinion, a terrible design. There's just no reason to make the two-player game feel so radically different and mean-spirited than any other player count. But then I came up with a perfectly valid solution that I've tested, and it works great. Here's what you do. At the beginning of the round, you uh, place out the uh, the Emperor like you normally do. They're basically, whoever's the lead player reveals a little token, says the Emperor can be in one of two spots. And so you uh, pick whichever one of those two spots is better for you because it's good to be the first player. And then players start placing their workers. I suggest an additional step. You put your Emperor where you want to go. Um, and then draw two more of those emperor tiles and put the, uh, oh, whatchamacallum, the centurions where those emperor tiles tell you to place them. So they just all get placed immediately. Just, you know, boom. And so all those spaces are just gobbled up right at the beginning of the round. And so the grid becomes a more interesting puzzle for you to try to maneuver as the game goes on. And boom, it just works. It's incredibly simple and easy. Now, there's a few different ways you could do it. You could say, hey, have all the Centurions come out immediately. Or you could say, you know what? After I take my turn, I draw a thing and put two Centurions out. So it's kind of more like, uh, you know, players are taking multiple turns throughout a round. I mean, because that's, you know, in a four-player game, I'd put a worker out. You'd put a worker out. And then other players would put workers out that are blocking me. But in the two-player game, oh, I'm just supposed to purposely block you with useless spaces. Which, again, is just horrible. Don't like it. So uh, you could say, though, that those uh, centurions kind of get drip fed out over the course of the round. But me, I found it was better just to say, hey, you know what? As part of set at the beginning of the round, boom, put them all out. And if you want to make first player a little bit more powerful, actually have the centurions placed first. And then the, pl the lead player, whoever's the first player, draws the thing that says one of the two places where the emperor could go. And then they can make their best choice. So this is how Jen and I played it. And it worked phenomenally. Uh, there was a lot of tension. There was a lot of excitement of, can we get the right space? But at no point were Jen and I ever going out of our way to mess with each other. And a game is just so much better. I do not understand why Stan didn't go with this really obvious choice. He has all the pieces there for it. Um, and by the way, this is not too far removed from the way the solo game works. It's almost exactly the same. So, I would suggest doing that. I really do need to go post on Board Game Geek, uh, you know, a, a variant thread saying this is how I suggest you do it. Um, actually, wait, no, no, no. Or did I? Did I already post that? I think I may have posted to an existing thread of this is how Jen and I were doing it. But regardless, with that variant, suddenly the game becomes phenomenal. And it's one of Stan Kardonsky's best designs yet. And it comes in at number four. Now, there is one other problem. And this is kind of a problem with a lot of Stan's games. It... I'm not going to say it overstays its welcome, but it does go on a bit long. And honestly, I forget whether it's four or five rounds this game lasts. But if it's four rounds, the game should probably only last three rounds. If it's five rounds the game goes, it really should only be four rounds. Because, I mean, this isn't quite as extreme as some of his other games, but you can get a lot done. And really, by the time you are three quarters of the way through the game, you kind of feel like you've done a full game's worth of stuff. And then you play for one more round, and you just don't need to. I'm just starting to think this is the way Stan likes it. This was an issue widely reported with Endless Winter. And um, with, uh, oh, his earlier game this year, Minos. A lot of people uh, suggested there as well that the game should end sooner. And so it just seems like it's kind of the way Stan digs it, that Stan loves making these things drag, or, you know, not drag, again, because they are fun from start to finish, but you you often, and I felt this way playing this game, that like, okay, the game could be over now. We don't have to do a full another round of stuff. Are we really going to do this? I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, overall, it's still a fantastic game. I'm kind of on the fence about keeping it because I'm not sure about the length, and I'm not sure, and, and plus, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, I, I really don't like doing house variants. And if, it, if, you know, I'm honestly, I could play Shadow Kingdom of Valeria, and that doesn't need a house rule variant for me. Or I could play Endless Winter, it doesn't need a house rule variant. Although it ultimately did get official rules updates to say, hey, you could play the game for one less round. You don't have to play it the stand way where, you know, 90% of everything you want to get done gets done. Because that's the interesting thing. Um, I, I mentioned right up front, there's that little grid. That 9x9 nine nine grid, 
And over the course of the game, if you pursue certain agendas, you can ultimately get, if I recall correctly, seven objective tokens that you could then deploy on that grid when you complete an objective to mark that you've done it. And um, Jen and I found it was not hard at all to ensure that we, every time we played, did seven of the nine objectives. And that felt like we're doing too much. We should have to work really, really hard. And it's like our special focus to make sure we get all of those. And we have to sacrifice other things to do it. But nope. You can just do it. It's just not that hard. Uh, you know, when Jen and I played it, also when I played the solo game, I found the same thing to be true as well. It just wasn't that hard to get everything done that you wanted to do. And again, this is just a thing with Stan's designs. I'm sure a lot of people love them. You know, because there are plenty of folks who like play the White Castle and say, why does the game end so soon? Just when it's getting good, I want to keep going. Stan is apparently a designer who says, oh, you get to keep going and going and going and you're going to do a lot of stuff and i guess i'm just the type of player who wants you know you know leave me wanting more stan doesn't do that but i think maybe stan maybe start looking at that as a variant for all your games because i think i'm not alone in my opinion about this i mean obviously fantasia games made the change to endless winter because so many people mentioned it for there but regardless all that's beside the point the game is still fantastico one of Stan's best, with those caveats I just laid out, which is why it came in at number four of the month. Okay, now let's go on to number three of the month, Wingspan with the Asia expansion. Or, I mean, interesting, uh, Wingspan Asia is a standalone two-player-only version of Wingspan, but it also functions as an expansion for Wingspan. So... You can ignore the duet two-player special rules, or you can use them with the other Wingspan stuff. It's I'm just going to consider it an expansion because, I mean, if you get this and you like it, you're going to get other Wingspan stuff. And this is a great um, uh, addition to Wingspan. Of course, like all the other expansions, there's a bunch of new birds. And if there's one new thing that is kind of the central deal of this in terms of new powers for the birds, there's lots of push your luck birds in this big deck of cards. Uh, birds that say, hey, when you activate me, start drawing cards. And as long as the total wingspan, you know, it's like a hunting bird. As long as your total wingspan doesn't go over like 200 centimeters, you don't bust. But if you hunt too, so you can, but you can keep everything. But if you go too long, uh, if you uh, go, if you roll dice over and over again, trying to get the right type of food, or if you draw cards, there are a bunch of these kind of push your luck things spread throughout the game. They're fun. They're not my favorite thing, but I enjoy them. Um, but more importantly, what Asia adds is this new alternate way that you can score uh, end of round objectives. Wingspan, you play over four rounds. And what you do is you replace the original Wingspan objective board, where every time you play, you're going to get a combination of four, or a unique combination of four objectives like uh, get birds that have a, a you know geometry in their name, or that all face to the left on the card, or whatever. And, you know, they all have nice little thematic names and all of that. Uh, or no, I mean, uh, actually, no, the objective cards do. But, uh, you know, there's these other objective tiles that we're competing for on every round. That has been replaced with this new concept where there's still objectives, but you're trying, um, the objectives are all about how you are going to deploy these little yin-yang symbols that you've got. Whenever you put a bird on your board, uh, and cover up a space, you take one of these little symbols that's in your color and put it on this main board. And the place you put it is based on either um, the, uh, or first of all, it has to go into, if you if you did a wetlands bird, it has to go into the wetlands section of the map. Or if you did a, you know, a grassland bird, it goes into the grasslands. But then you pick a spot in the grasslands that either matches the type of food the bird eats or the um, the wingspan of the bird, or the food, or the or I'm sorry, the nest it uses, or whatever. And so there's this extra puzzle layered on top, because what you're trying to do is you are trying to ensure you have the biggest contiguous grouping of your tokens, because you get extra points for everything in that one big group. So you're trying to make these chains of stuff. And so in return, that then limits how you're going to play birds, because, hey, I want to play this bird right now. But if I do, it means my token on the map is going to go way off into the corner and I'm never going to get over there. It's not going to be part of anything. So instead, you don't have to put it on the map. You can put it over into this special pool, and then anytime you want, you can use it to re-roll all the dice or wipe the uh, bird market if you're desperate for something. And that's a nice addition. 
I mean, this whole thing is nice. And it's interesting. You can see Amy and Maggie, they actually covered this earlier in the year for the channel. And I believe they said at the time they would never play Wingspan as a two-player game without this alternate objective scoring because it just, it really does add an extra level of depth to the game. I like it. But I don't necessarily think it's that awesome. I just think, oh, it's different. It's not better. If anything, it's maybe a little worse because it does kind of slow the game down because you have a lot more to consider with every bird you play. You know, in a regular wingspan, oh, there's just, I just need to, you know, um, make small birds. That's all I'm trying to do. But here, I, oh, I'm, I'm trying to get birds that are of this particular food type, or if not that, this particular wingspan. And it just gets a bit more, I mean, it's nice. I'm not, I'm not complaining about all. It's a nice alternative, but it's not better. It's just different. So, I, I really, the reason to get the Wing Expand Asia expansion is more for the new birds, at least to my way of thinking. Now, there's another thing it adds, which I haven't tried. It actually changes the rules so you can play a team game, and I think the game can go up to eight players if you combine this with regular Wingspan. And But then there's like uh, two teams or maybe four teams or something like that. I haven't actually even read the rules. I don't know how that works, but I could certainly see that being valuable for folks who love Wingspan and want to turn it into a big seven-person game or something like that. That's cool that it's available. That's nice, but not really for me and Jen. So anyway, Wingspan to Asia, is it my favorite expansion? No, but I'm glad I've got it. It's nice to have more Wingspan variation. There's one more thing I should mention. It isn't actually about Wingspan to Asia. It's actually about Wingspan to Oceania, which uh, at the time I said was probably my least favorite because I was not a big fan of the Nectar. I'm still not. Although, as far as I'm concerned, the Nectar issue has been fixed. There's an excellent thread on Board Game Geek about it. Uh, ask me down in the show notes and I'll I'll explain. Um, but anyway, one of the things that I had missed when I originally played Oceania, and I was really focusing on you know the new, more powerful boards and the Nectar tokens and all that, was there was a new cooperative mode. It, I, it was years went by, and I had no idea there was an official co-op rule set for Wingspan. And so when Jen and I got out Wingspan Asia and finally got a chance to play it, I said, hey, let's use these co-op rules too. Well, actually, first we played it competitively and that was nice. And I said, let's play it again with the co-op rules because I really want to try them. And for folks who are interested, yes, the co-op rules from Oceania um, work perfectly well with Asia. They work with everything. And you don't have to buy Wingspan Oceania, Oceania to get the co-op rules. You can just download the rule book for it. But anyway, I don't think I would ever play Wingspan with Jen now as a competitive game. The co-op game is so much better. It's It works great with Asia. It work, I'm sure it'll work great with anything. It's the idea that you bring in the automated player from the solo game, and they're just doing their normal stuff, and players are playing their normal game, but to win, the average score of the two players has to beat the score of the Automa player. Or if you want it slightly harder, um, the lower score of the two players has to beat the Automa. And that's it. There's a couple of rules. Players can sacrifice an egg to the Automa, thereby losing a point to give another egg to their teammate. Or if you want, you can give up an egg or a card or a food to give a card to somebody else. So there are ways that players can cooperate with each other. If I'm desperate for that forest bird that has a particular nest, and I've been searching the whole game for it, and it shows up in your hand, you can give it to me if you sacrifice an egg or something like that. That's great. I would much rather... Uh, oh, and then plus, you know, there are so many interactions in Wingspan, and often when you decide to do these interactions, you're doing it in such a way, right, what is the way that I can do this to help you the least? Um, it is so nice to instead change the way you think and say, what is the way, what is the timing I can use of this card to help you the most because we're in this together? And really, shouldn't bird lovers be in it together? Why are we, you know, trying to outmaneuver each other? We all love birds. The co-op rules from Oceana are awesome. And they work great. They work great with Asia expansion. The Asia expansion is very nice. As I'm, I'm happy to have it. Someday I might try to play it as super high player count game, but that's pretty much it. You know, Wingspan uh, deservedly uh, occupies one of the... Is it the most successful in terms of sales board game in the last decade? It might be. Oops, I went too long. Didn't rewind. Sorry, just talked and talked and talked. Um... And, but anyway, it deserves it. Wingspan is phenomenal. And as more content keeps coming out, I'll keep playing it. Uh, I enjoyed Asia, and I really enjoyed the co-op mode. That's Wingspan Asia coming in at number three of the month. So what could beat it, right? Well, let me tell you. Number two 
of the month uh, was a sponsored preview that I did for a game that will be coming out on crowdfunding in early 2025. I think it'll be uh, crowdfunding in either January or February, but I got it way early and Jen and I have been playing it on the road and we have really been blown away by my number two, La Patisserie Rococo. Now this is a sequel to Rococo which is one of the all-time great deck builders. Uh, it was originally designed by um, Lewis and Stefan Malls and teaming up with oh, Matthias Kramer. The three of them designed the original Rococo. And I've recovered Rococo back in the day. I recover, I covered the cool deluxe edition of Rococo a couple of years ago that it came out that made it even better. And now this is basically Rococo 3, or it's a Rococo spinoff that uses largely the same core deck building of the Rococo game, but in a new setting that plays in, I don't know if it's half the time, but at least it's a 30%, if not 50% faster game than Rococo. Now we're still, you know, there, there's still a big party going on at Versailles, but instead of us trying to make all the fine clothing for all the nobles, we're instead trying to make delicious baked goods because there's a competition and we're gathering resources used to be thread and a fabric. Now it's flour and cream and chocolate or whatever that we're trying to gather. And instead of fulfilling recipes to make gowns and, you know, uh, uh, pantaloons, we're trying to make delicious cakes and cookies and all kinds of stuff. And, um, and then, uh, you know, instead of putting flourishes, we're trying to decorate, you know, put extra flourish on. And, and, and then instead of getting the clothes into particular places in the palace for an area majority thing, we're trying to put them on different tables, uh, for judging in the, uh, uh, patisserie contest. And so there is an area majority thing. There's really, this is kind of like Rococo Express when it boils right down to it because it plays so much faster. Uh, and it is so much more elegant. A lot of the extemporaneous rules have been stripped away. And honestly, for Jen, I would say she would, I don't think she would ever want to go back to Rococo now because this game gives all the brilliant deck building Rococo vibes. Uh, because, I mean, Rococo came out over a decade ago, you know, after, and it was maybe, it was maybe the first big, hey, deck building can be more than just Dominion with a deck of cards. You can do a lot more. And Rococo still stands as one of the best deck builders today because uh, whenever at the beginning of a round and you're drawing cards, you have access to your entire deck and you pick what cards you want out of your deck. And then they get discarded and then your deck gets smaller until you eventually reshuffle. That is such a brilliant thing that I just have not seen other, I'm sure there must be other deck builders that do it, but it's still something that Rococo owns and it makes Rococo one of the best because there's never been a deck builder where you have more control over your deck and that just makes it so satisfying plus it's a deck of multi-use cards because you're going to put on your turn you're going to play a card to do one of a bunch of different actions and different actions are available whether it's a master chef or whether it's an apprentice chef um, but then each card also has a bonus action it gets to do so right now i need to play an apprentice because my master chefs won't go out and collect the ingredients i need to have an apprentice go collect ingredients but my one apprentice i've got in my hand has a terrible action but you know what i can use this master to recruit another apprentice and then use that apprentice you get the those hires immediately. They come right to you and you just keep on playing. Everything about this game is sped up, more efficient, more elegant, but with all the depth of the original game. And again, I think I'd have a, I, I know Jen, I, when we get home, I'm probably going to have to get rid of my uh, Rococo because to make room for Rococo Patisserie or Patisserie de Rococo. I'm inclined to agree with her. I love uh, big complex games more than Jen. But it's so nicely done here. Uh, and, and so mouthwatering, too. That's a real problem for the game. Uh, you know, Jen and I, we try to be relatively low carbers, but oh, this is a carb lover's dream, uh, the theme of this game. And again, it's got the great gameplay made better than ever. Uh, the Maltzes, Stefan and Louis, they revisited their classic and improved on it in every way. Uh, it's interesting. This game actually originally tried to crowdfund earlier in 2024 with a completely new theme. It was called like Cookie Masters or something like that. It was like a reality TV bake-off show where we were making cookies and it failed to catch on. It just didn't really get traction. Um, and so it must have been painful for publisher Eagle Griffin Games to pull the plug on that and commission entirely new art from entire because you know that game was done and it's expensive to do a ton of game art, but they did it and I'm glad they did because 
I think when La Petite Rococo comes out, it's going to do much better because, you know, Cookie Masters looked like a family-friendly gateway game. It was not. It was a crunchy game. Now it's an elegant, refined game, um, you know, as a, following on the lineage of the original Rococo, and it's phenomenal. I mean, I've only scratched the surface, and now you're going to see my run-through in the new year when um you know when when the crowdfunding game or when the crowdfunding launch goes live although if you want to see it right now folks it's available for backers of my show if you back at the resident level you get to see every video for the channel days weeks sometimes even months early so backers of the uh, show get to watch this run through now or at least it will be available soon after paulo goof checks it but everybody's going to be able to see it and i'm telling you right now folks this is going to be one of the early hits of 2025 in crowdfunding because it is Phenomenal. My number two game of the month, La Patisserie Rococo. But folks, we've got one more game to talk about. Once again, oh, why are you... Let me mute that again and uh, make this the number one game. It is Colab. Now, Colab is a game that I did cover when it was crowdfunding, gosh, I want to say two or three years ago. And I think it's finally... Can we please just get a picture of the... Right, there we go. Uh, oh, why do I keep covering up the board with pictures of cards? It seems to be impossible. There we go, fine. So, uh, Colab is a worker placement game where we are a bunch of mad scientists with minions um, trying to brew potions, make uh, machines, and, um, you know, animate creatures, monstrous creatures. Oh, they're, they're all adorable creatures when it boils right down to it. Um, and it's a worker placement game where every round, the first thing you're going to do is you are going to either deploy or recall one of your minions. And your minions have little dice on them. Um, you're, so basically, you're sending a minion as a worker out to the board to one of the, was it, the six towers and activating the power of the tower. Then the second thing you do on your turn is you take your one worker, your mad scientist worker, and you move it to any of the six labs. And then that scientist gets the help of all of the minions that are in that lab, whether they're mine or yours. And so um, every time I put a worker out, I'm, I'm trying to get a special power I need from the given worker placement spot that they are going to. Plus, I'm trying to set up a better location for my scientists to go to so that they can do bigger actions of, you know, playing cards or harvesting goods to be able to play the cards. That's the crux of the game. You can watch my run through to see it in action. There's a link down in the show notes. And I was really blown away by the game when I covered it, when it was crowdfunding. Oh, because that's only half the game. There's this worker placement thing where there's where players are really intertwined with each other in a positive way as opposed to a negative way, and it's fantastic. Love it. The second half of the game is what we're ultimately trying to do, we have a handful of cards, and now I can't find any of those cards, and we're trying to get them played. Uh, each of us is making, a, I think, up to 4 by 4 grid of cards. And all of these cards are super smart and very cleverly designed with all kinds of cool combo powers. And so you're trying to, you know, set up spots. I'm kind of reminded of the tiling in Glenmore. It's that good. Especially because, I mentioned Glenmore, because a lot of times when you put a card down next to other cards, it activates the other cards. Or maybe it has a... Um, you know, a uh, an adjacency rule that comes up based on cards that are next to it or things that are in the same row or column and all that. Again, that kind of stuff is great going back into the day in Glenmore, and it's phenomenal here. So this game really has two big halves, a really innovative and wonderful worker placement game with a ton of positive interaction between players, and then a brilliant tableau building game, one of the best. Um, and I loved it. When I crowdfunded, it, I finally got to play the final thing, and I love it even more. Now, here's the reason I'm talking about it today and giving you folks an update. When it was crowdfunding, I did complain that I had one problem with the game. It was too long. Because the game ended once somebody had actually successfully built 12 cards, if I recall correctly. I think that's what it was. And I mentioned in the rulebook that my only... Man, this game just... It overstays its, it doesn't overstay its welcome, but it, but I mean, by the time you're two thirds of the way through the game, you feel like, oh, I've done so much, and yet it keeps going. Here's the deal um, the developers heard my plea, and the final version of the game comes with an express mode that cuts down the length of the game by probably about 20 or 30 minutes. And it's, Chef's Kiss, perfect. It's just the right length. I am very, very happy with it. I was so excited when I found out that they had, uh, they were coming up with rules. I couldn't wait to try them. I have tried them, and I can tell you, folks, Colab. Here's the deal: Colab might make it into my top ten for 2024. 
It's so good. It's always been so good. And it's number one issue I had with it has been resolved. And, um, oh, and there's also got a bunch of expansion content too, that I haven't even started playing with yet. So I'm excited about that as well. I am over the moon. The game is phenomenal. Go watch my original run through to see why and know that if you watch my final thoughts, my one big complaint has already been taken care with my number one best game of the month. Phew. Collab. All righty, everybody. And uh, that's it. Another month done and dusted. And uh, yeah, I've got to do a bit of editing now because I had to stop halfway through because of the solar panel. Oh, it looks like uh, the sun isn't quite as bright anymore. Now we're at, what are we at? Oh, you can't really read that. It's too close, isn't it? 300. Uh, there we go. Make it a bit less bright. and Make that go away. 340 watts, about almost halfway recharged. We're living totally off the grid down here in Baja and uh, loving every second of it, folks. But there's no rest for the wicked. I got an RV full of games. I got to go start reading so that we can uh, play some games in December and tell you about some more stuff at the uh, in the next roundup. So for now, I'm going to say thanks everyone for watching. Thanks especially to everybody who supports the show and helps keep Rado running here as a member, uh, um, you know, uh, or over at Patreon. And I scratched the surface. There are so many other great benefits. You get the ramble, you get releases, you get Q and A videos, all kinds of exclusives if you uh, back the show. So thanks to everybody for watching. Thanks if you like or leave a comment. Uh, thanks just for getting my numbers up by just watching. Thanks uh, for uh, people who support the show. And finally, in closing, of course, thanks to Let the Heroes Out, which, as I mentioned up front, is crowdfunding their excellent digital implementation right now. Link for it down in the show notes, and you can learn more. Okay, everybody, talk to you later. See you next month. So long. Bye.